Um, well, welcome everybody. For those of you that may not know me, my name is Greg Whitcup. I'm the director of the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research. Uh, because the audience tonight, I think, is a little bit more diverse than uh, some of our audiences, I thought I would just spend uh, a minute giving a little bit of a sense of what the center is all about and why we are hosting this event. Um, we were created about a decade ago with the stated goal of, of stewarding and sharing uh, the legacy and history of the entire campus, the entire Cranbrook educational community. We do that in a variety of ways. We are the cur curators of the historic architecture at, at Cranbrook. We steward the three historic house museums, including the relatively recently acquired Frank Lloyd Wright Smith House. Uh, we oversee the campus-wide collection of cultural properties. Think the gates on the campus, uh, uh, the fountains, but at the heart of, of literally everything we do is Cranbrook archives, uh, comprising approximately, and this is very hard to quantify, uh, but Deborah tells me 2.5 million documents and photographs and individual uh, uh, negatives, um, including collections of papers such as uh, the celebrated collection of Kathy and Michael McCoy that they donated to Cranbrook Archives shortly after they left uh, Cranbrook. So the program tonight, Uncovering the Archives, is a program that we've been doing periodically as a way of sharing some of those archival collections with audiences around the world. But more specifically, they are also about um, giving the stage uh, to somebody like our speaker tonight and allowing uh, Colin Fanning in this case to show what he has been uncovering in the archives and how these collections lead to new research. Uh, so we are very honored uh, to have Colin joining us today and um, equally honored to have Kathy and Michael McCoy, the subject of today's program, joining us. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Deborah Rice, uh, head archivist at Cranbrook Archives, uh, who in turn will introduce Colin. Deborah. Okay, thank you, Greg. Um, I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to everyone uh, from the Cranbrook Archives Reading Room, where I'm sitting right now. Uh, you may recognize a few items behind you that you'll hear more about um, shortly. Uh, this is our third installment of Uncovering the Archives. Uh, and we feel that while the center and our colleagues across campus regularly use our archives collections, uh, both to learn from our own history or preserve and interpret Cranbrook's museum collections and historic architecture and landscapes, scholars from around the globe, like Colin, uh, may utilize the same materials in entirely different ways. Uh, considering new or different perspectives from outside Cranbrook is really critical for, balance, for a balanced understanding of Cranbrook's history and the role uh, the archives play in its interpretation. Our program this evening begins with scholar and curator of decorative arts, design, history, and material culture, Colin Fanny. Uh, who will examine the 1980s design world through the lens of Cranbrook Academy of Arts Design Department, then led by Catherine and Michael McCoy. Uh, the McCoy's papers at Cranbrook Archives document their two decades at the Academy and comprise one of our largest collections of former faculty. Fanning will highlight items he studied in these papers and elsewhere, leading us through his research journey. Following his presentation, we'll take a deeper dive into a few of the items here at Cranbrook Archives and discuss exactly how they proved central to his research. And then we will open up to 
to all of you, our audience, for comments and questions. Uh, a quick reminder before we begin that you can type in uh, these comments and questions at any time during the program. I will be monitoring, monitoring those, and we will address those at the end uh, during the Q&A. Or if you prefer, uh, you're always welcome to unmute yourself at that time and ask yourselves. Uh, and so now I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Colin Fanning, Assistant Curator in the Department of European Decorative Arts and Sculpture at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Mr. Fanning is also completing work on his dissertation entitled Good Partners, Catherine McCoy, Michael McCoy, and the Discourse of Design at the Cranbrook Academy of Art, 1971 to 1995 at the Bard Graduate Center. Prior to the Philadelphia Museum of Art, Mr. Fanning has held positions at the Denver Art Museum and both the Museum of Arts and Design and the American Federation of Arts in New York. Amongst his impressive list of accomplishments are four papers he has presented on Cranbrook and the McCoys. So we're excited to have him with us today to share an adaptation of his latest, the Language of Objects, Product Semantics, and Industrial Design at the Cranbrook Academy of Art, which he delivered at the New York University's Institute of Fine Arts in 2022 and has tailored exclusively for our audience tonight. So Colin, uh, take it away. Well, thank you so much. Let me get my screen share going here. Uh, I will assume, unless anyone tells me otherwise, that you can all see my slides. Thanks for the thumbs up. Well, thank you so much, Deborah, for that that really kind introduction, and and to Greg as well. Um, and of course, I, I have to start this talk with really by thanking the whole staff of the Cranbrook Center for for collections and the Cranbrook Art Museum, not not just for the invitation to speak tonight, but also really for the the really generous assistance they have provided in the course of my research. Um, and I also want to thank the Bard Graduate Center um, for a dissertation research grant that supported my time uh, at Cranbrook and, and studying the archives there. And of course, my, my greatest gratitude goes to Catherine and Michael McCoy themselves, who are with us tonight, um, and they're the many students of theirs that I've, I've been able to speak with um, in the course of my work, and more to come. Honestly, it's, it's a project without end in some ways, although my advisor would respectfully disagree. Um, and, you know, truly, Mike and Kathy, without your sort of willing enthusiasm to be uh, to be the subjects of a dissertation, none of this would be possible. So I'm, I'm so glad you're here and hope it's not uh, not too strange to be the in the, <laughs> the sort of uh, magnifying lens tonight. Um, so as as Deva mentioned, um, this is essentially going to be a, a version of a talk I've already given in, in another setting. It's more of a case study on the industrial design side of the uh, the um, design department at, at Cranbrook. So I, I noticed that we have a few of the graphic design uh, alumni in in the crowd. So don't worry, you're you're in the mix too. But I'm I'm looking at a sort of smaller subset today. So I'll I'll jump in. Writing in a 1988 survey of recent American design, design educators Catherine and Michael McCoy captured a perennial challenge of the creative arts. And I quote: "If it can be anything." what should it be, end quote. And it was a question that landed, I think, particularly heavily in the design professions in the sort of apparent capitalist frenzy of the 1980s, when a whole proliferation of consumer technologies and new aesthetics raised some doubts about the relevance and responsibility of design for, for many practitioners. You know, were, were designers mere cogs in the corporate machinery? Were they subservient to advertising departments and the all-powerful profit motive? Or did they have distinct contributions to offer in this rapidly shifting cultural landscape? And the McCoys were, I think, particularly well placed to pose some of these questions in their role as co-chairs of the graduate design program at the Cranbrook Academy of Art. And as many of you tonight will know, you know, this, this academy had been founded in 1932 by George Booth and the Finnish architect Elio Saarinen. And its approach to art and design education was initially established along sort of an arts and crafts line, you know, thinking about um, informality and self-direction and the integration of arts with everyday life. But a couple of decades on, the Academy was producing some of the giants of 20th century American design, among other fields, of course. Um, and alumni and former faculty include the likes of Charles and Ray Eames, um, Ara Saarinen, Florence Knoll, Harry Bertoia, 
and many others who shaped the, the sort of image of mid-century modernity in the US and beyond. But by 1971, when the McCoys began their own 24-year tenure as co-chairs of the design department, the Academy's somewhat idiosyncratic approach with no classes or no structured curriculum to speak of was something of an outlier among a kind of larger national effort to standardize the structure and the content of US design education. But in concert with their students and a, a really rich ne network of other design educators and, and industry contacts, Mike and Kathy fostered Cranbrook's remarkable repositioning as a forum for questioning some of design's longstanding norms and conceptual foundations. And the McCoy's teaching at Cranbrook and their, their larger impact on the field of design with the long list of no notable former students characterized by print magazine as the McCoy generation on the occasion of their departure from the program um, in 95, 96. Uh, while this, this is all the sort of larger story is the subject of my ongoing dissertation research, my talk tonight will focus specifically on what I see as, as kind of a key, interesting, and important moment for the 3D design side of the studio, which Michael McCoy generally stewarded. But at the outset, I want to, to show this wonderful poster for the program that Kathy designed, uh, just to signal that the program's conceptual investigations really ran across these spheres of design, whether graphic or product or furniture or, an envir or environment. And a lot of the, the influential and, and well-known graphic design work that Catherine and her students were, were producing in the 1980s uh, drew on a lot of the same theoretical conversations that informed the work that I'll be specifically showing you and, and discussing tonight. So I, I just mentioned this, that, that you're able to keep in mind that this really is a cross-disciplinary story, even if I have something of a narrower focus um, in, in the rest of the talk. So beginning in the mid 19 early to mid 1980s, the product design side of the studio engaged an emerging design methodology called product semantics. And under what you could call a kind of broader umbrella of postmodern design, and that term has its many kind of nuances to, to unpick, uh, but it, it tends to carry these connotations, right, of irony or pastiche or, or sort of rule breaking in a general sense. Product semantics was actually a, a rather more earnest attempt to really redefine the creation of functional goods as a matter of communication. Cranbrook students, uh, under the, the guidance of the McCoys, gave form to a set of theories that pursued the possibility of more communicative and meaningful mass-produced goods, and placing the cultural and psychological dimensions of objects firmly within the designer's kind of brief, you know, something that they should be considering alongside form and production and so on. And in a moment when sort of the, the earliest generation or of uh, kind of ubiquitous computing, the earliest sort of dawn of that idea was really teetering between the optimism and anxiety, these explorations at Cranbrook, I think, weren't just a search for suitable formal expression, but they also represented an attempt to defend the relevance of industrial design as a field, as a, as a discipline for this information age that was still kind of uh, in, the in the process of taking shape. And so, so the key theorists behind this, this term, product semantics, were two German emigres to the United States. Klaus Krippendorf, who is a professor of communications at the University of Pennsylvania here in Philadelphia, and Reinhard Buter, a professor, professor of industrial design at Ohio State University. And both of them had studied at the Hochschule für Gestaltung Ulm, or the Ulm School of Design, which was a West German institution that had been founded in 1953 more or less as a kind of successor to the very well-known interwar Bauhaus school. While the institutions, while both of those institutions similarly sought to shape the designed environment through collaboration with industry, you know, seeing industry as the, the kind of future of design, Ulm nevertheless rejected the Bauhaus's more artistic or formalist ethos in favor of a, a really technocratic approach. And they borrowed from economics and the social sciences, systems theory, all of these things that kind of lived outside prior versions of, of design education. But Ulm's critics, on the other hand, held that its emphasis on a kind of reductive geometry and this visual rhetoric of rationality could actually obscure as much as it clarified, particularly in the rapidly growing category of consumer electronics, a, a sort of new type of thing for, for this post-war moment. And through the Industrial Designer Society of America, a, a professional organization, um, Krippendorf and Butter connected with the McCoys around a kind of broader shared dissatisfaction with what they saw as this, what you might call this kind of false universality of, of modernism. 
and informed especially by Krippendorf's scholarship, product semantics was a proposed departure from the kind of black box approach to design, which made things opaque to their users, concealing their functions behind these, these kind of uncommunicative facades, and thereby kind of tripping up the idea of, of easy use or, or kind of integration in, in everyday life. And writing in a jointly edited this 1984 issue of the IDSA magazine Innovation, Krippendorf and Butter argued that Ulm's narrow definition of good form overlooked how this much more subjective and ambiguous relationship between people and things was an equally important terrain for designers. And I'll, I'll quote here a little bit at length just because I think it's key as a, as a kind of document of their thinking. And they wrote, product semantics is the study of the symbolic qualities of man-made forms in the context of their use and the application of this knowledge to industrial design. It takes into account not just physical and physiological functions, but the psychological, social, and cultural context, which we call the symbolic environment. Product semantics is an effort to understand and to take full responsibility for the symbolic environment into which industrial products are placed and where they should function by virtue of their own communicative qualities. Through product semantics, designers can demystify complex technology, improve the interaction between artifacts and their users, and enhance opportunities for self-expression. So this, this, I think, is a really clear kind of statement of, of the goals of this, this method, this methodology. And of course, I, I think it's important to note, too, that, that Krippendorf and Buter certainly not discover the idea of symbolic meaning in, in objects or design. It's something that's very deeply embedded in the history of, of form making in every medium. But what I think is, is particularly special or kind of novel about this is this very specific attempt to appropriate this theory of, of meaning and semiotics as an explicit guide for designing contemporary goods, especially technology. And so the specific semiotic theory undergirding this argument, and I know this gets a little, the air gets a little thin here. I promise I'll try to make it as, as accessible as I can. <laughs> as a, a non-linguist or non-semiotician myself, um, you know, we'll, we'll get through it together. Uh, the, the specific theory undergirding this argument was the so-called semantic triangle, which was described by Charles K. Ogden and Ivor Armstrong Richards in a, a really influential tre treatise in 1923 titled The Meaning of Meaning. And their model, based on some prior work by Charles Sanders Pierce, who's considered, you know, kind of one of the, the fathers of semiotics, positioned human thought as the hinge between signs and reference or for the purposes of industrial design between concepts and things, physical things. And it's notable that this choice of framework supported, I think, a particular kind of designerly agency. So in contrast to some other theories around semiotics that, that really favored an emphasis on kind of mental constructs over the idea of a shared material existence, Ogden, Ogden and Richards actually begin with the assumption that we, we all kind of share a material reality. And so skating across some of this, this more philosophically fraught material, uh, product semantics as, as an idea placed designers at this, at this hinge, you know, at this center of the meaning making process. And their task would then be to narrow the distance between the signifying aspects of a design object, you know, what it says, and the blend of functional qualities and cultural associations that object might embody. So what it does. And you know, the, this is illustrated in Krippendorf and Buter's uh, article by these examples of, of student work and, and things like that, really around sort of some very basic principles that I think are, are quite familiar today. So this idea of an object should tell you if it has a control of some sort, if it has a top or a bottom, you know, a proper orientation, it should tell you what it's for through its own form. And as you can see, this mode of thinking leaned really heavily on the field of linguistics, complete with, you know, these kind of wonderful complex diagrams. And Krippendorf and Butter were really trying to map out this process of how meaning is made and then consumed uh, within this kind of user object um, relationship. And as that pertains to design, what is the designer's role in this? But the specifics of how to take full responsibility for the symbolic environment was really largely left to designer's imagination or, or intuition or even preference. So I think it's it's worth noting that the, the opportunities for self-expression that Krippendorf and Butter write about were in practice as much for the designers as they were for the users of the things they designed. 
And I think this really becomes clear and is, is kind of illustrated to wonderful effect when we start to look at the impact this theory had on the Cranbrook studi uh, studios and the students stu um, studying sort of product design and, and three-dimensional design there. And fueled by a lively studio culture of theoretical readings and discussion, the Cranbrook projects in this period generally fell into one of two broad camps. First was the directly symbolic, where the metaphors were sometimes pretty pretty blatant, right? Uh, positioned as a kind of color commentary on the idea of technological life and, and living. So a picture phone that's formatted as a picture frame, right? To, to comment on this kind of idea of seeing one another and, and communicating through an image. Or this stereo receiver that has an interface structured around the idea of, of musical notation and is kind of wrapped with these silhouettes of instruments. And this, this project, a design for a microwave by the student Paul Montgomery, aimed to evoke the archetypal lunchbox used by blue collar tradespeople. So a, a category of object that had ostensibly been replaced in the transition from the machine age to the information age, right? Overshadowed by kind of white collar label and the office lunches. Uh, but those very office lunches are the things that this kind of microwave might be used to reheat. So there's a there's a kind of subtle irony to, to a lot of this work. And the second camp of, of projects took what I think see as more of a, a kind of abstracted or poetic approach, where sometimes the operative metaphors underlying the, the work were more suggested than directly spelled out. So you might propose formal cues for heat or coolness through color and form, or controls that would announce themselves in this, this you know, kind of obsession with self-evidence. Um, and that itself was a way of kind of easing the, the tech-driven experience of, of daily life. And the book Computer by David Gresham, uh, one of the, the notable students of this moment, um, although they're all notable, I, I really can't stress that enough. Uh, but this book computer uh, model is really an exemplar of how the student work in this period played out in the realm of consumer computing, um, which at this point is in this very interesting moment, right? If you think about the kind of early to mid 80s and, and where the computer as a, a kind of broadly understood object was uh, at that point. So it counters the stream of blunt beige boxes that were emerging from Silicon Valley at the time. And Gresham proposes a formal reworking for the computer that responds more to the context of a desktop, right? Where it could sit among books and papers and really become more of a natural extension of a user's work. And Gresham also suggested that the computer's components, much like a stack of books, would be modular, therefore enabling easier expansion or upgrades over time. And the, the technical sophistication of many of these student projects rendered them really well-suited for photographic reproduction and thus circulation in a wider professional discourse. And indeed, they, they found really ready homes in a lot of the design industry press where they gave a kind of charismatic face to what would be an otherwise really abstract idea of product semantics. And Michael McCoy himself, I think, leaned heavily on, on the student work in his own writing and speaking and advocacy for the topic and pointed to projects in the Cranbrook studios as themselves as a kind of self-evidence for what product semantics could offer to the field. And I think, you know, in, in many ways, industry seems to have taken note. Um, more than one computer manufacturer in this period was using the same kind of metaphor of the bookshelf, right? This kind of modular architecture in some of their own prototypes. So whether the, the Apple or the uh, a lesser known um, Go Computer Corporation prototype here on the screen. And I, I you know, want to pause and point out too that it's it's very special to have had access to some of these actual physical models through the Cranbrook Art Museum's collection. You know, in my time at the archives, as well as the, the art museum, being able to get up close with these things and understand that the, the kind of high quality of the model and the, the tangibility of it was really key to communicating a lot of these ideas. And product semantics, I think, could have well remained something of an obscure theoretical discussion just happening in, you know, graduate programs. But uh, the McCoys and their, their collaborators were really adept at disseminating this, I, this notion into the working world of design. And so the, the earliest and perhaps most enthusiastic corporate patron of the product semantics approach was Philips, which was uh, a multinational uh, electronics manufacturing giant headquartered at the time in Eindhoven in the Netherlands and, and based today in Amsterdam. And their products in this period hewed largely towards a kind of utilitarian minimalism. So you might think about 
um, German competitors like Brown or or so on that had this kind of reductive modernist visual language. Although Philips was not known to be a kind of uh, design forward company um, at, at this sort of early moment. Um, and in 1980, Phillips hires Robert Blake uh, as director of the Concern Industrial Design Center, or CIDC, with the express mission of instituting a more cohesive and more integrated culture of design at the sprawling national company. And Blake is a, is a really crucial figure here for his relationship with the McCoys and with Cranbrook. He had previously been vice president of design at Herman Miller, of course, a, a furniture manufacturer based in Michigan with, with its own very close historical ties to, to Cranbrook. Um, and Blake became a very close colleague and I think eager supporter of the McCoys and their efforts in the design department at Cranbrook early on in their tenure there. And he carried that relationship with him to Phillips. And one of his earliest moves at the company was to invite the McCoys as visiting consultants to this design division um, in 1981. They were also designers in residence for the CIDC during a sabbatical in 1982 to 83. And then when Blake learned about a, a product semantics workshop at Cranbrook that IDSA had, had put on in 84, he asked the McCoys and their collaborators to mount a similar workshop for the Phillips designers. And in, in this whole sort of story, I've really been leaning on the material that I found in uh, Mike and Kathy's papers at the, the center um, to, to really kind of reconstruct the timeline and, and sort of go from point A to point B. And Deborah and I will talk about that a little bit later in, in the program. And so a set of, of consulting visits um, and, and then this workshop in 1984 really brought the product semantics idea to the heart of the microelectronics industry. And guided by a contingent, this contingent of American or American immigrant design educators, teams of Phillips designers speculated on how to prioritize this very kind of social and cultural and psychological uh, uh, notion of design and specifically thinking through existing Phillips products. So they, through a series of design charrettes and, and workshops and talks, we can see some of these corporate designers kind of tangling with, with some playful imagery and making allusions that you, that you might find unexpected. So a radio, for example, in the shape of Beethoven's head or a microwave shaped like a nuclear reactor. You know, some of this is, is kind of poking fun at itself, but at the other, at the other sense, there's you know kind of a desire to really examine the the function of products and kind of pull them apart so you, looking at this kind of deconstructed coffee maker in the lower left um but i i think there's this this kind of interesting tension you know it's some designers were more comfortable in this kind of playful or speculative mode others seem really reluctant to to leave their kind of familiar reductive modernist uh uh home and thinking about this workshop, um, the, the ideas met, I think, with a fair amount of skepticism in this very corporate setting where the notion of rational design was clearly a kind of deeply held corporate value. And I found a wonderful document in the archives that's a feedback survey, essentially, from, from the workshops. Um, and so going through that, you get a sense that, the, that this met with a kind of mixed receptions. You know, some of the, the designers um, complained about the terminology, right, that this is too theoretical. We're really just here to do design. Um, and others said, well, you're showing all these wonderful examples, but it's student work, you know, we're, we're professional designers. So I think, you know, you can, you start to see that there's this kind of tension between the realms of theory and practice between academic debate and, and the professional design department. So this, this merging of the two in the space of a workshop was, was not necessarily a kind of easy thing for some of the attendees. Um, but nevertheless, you know, Blake was still really committed to this, this kind of approach, and he hoped that product semantics would give the company especially a new sort of angle of attack in the market, um, particularly with in, in concert with its uh, competitors. And several products, Philips products in the second half of the 1980s, uh, demonstrated this kind of self-conscious symbolism. Um, so if I can advance here, there we go. Most famous probably is this roller radio, which took on a kind of vehicular form and all of its attendant associations of mobility and independence and freedom and so on. And it was actually such an unexpected hit that the company issued a second version as part of a larger product line called Moving Sound. So this, you start to see it becomes part of a larger kind of corporate marketing strategy that, that really takes the idea to a kind of literal end. And it, it makes these illusions of motion and freedom um, in a specific appeal to the, the sort of youth consumer market. And Phillips also tapped Michael and 
uh, through his consultancy, Thonstrom McCoy, which was a partnership with the Chicago-based designer and educator, Dale Thonstrom, to develop some additional speculative designs for electronic projects products. But as far as I'm aware, these, these only ever remained at the proposal stage. And Mike, you'll correct me later on if I have that wrong. But still, I, I, I think this marks an important shift too in some of the broader expectations of design education. So even in the you know, typically conservative sphere of corporate design, this really theoretical bent that that Cranbrook and the the kind of graduate level design discussions were were all about was starting to find more of a degree of of acceptance. And the topic of product semantics kind of steamrolled. It really took on a lot of um, visibility through publications and conferences that followed on from these earlier moments. Um, and here's Michael addressing uh, the one of the biggest conferences in in Helsinki in 1989. And as, at the same time as this conference, a special issue of Design Issues, the journal, was co-edited by, co by Krippendorf and Butter, and it contained expanded versions of the, the keynotes from that conference. So while this, this would seem to spell something of a broader success for the approach of product semantics, I also see it as, as starting to reveal some of the mounting internal differences among the this cohort of educators who who have been you know collaborating in in this arena, so Krippendorf himself continues to develop some very elaborate theories about the structure of communication between objects and users, and he increasingly leans more towards literatures on human cognition and and kind of its relationship to reality. So he's taking a much much more of a sort of science minded and and cognitive science specifically uh, direction. But then Michael's contribution to the journal, which was co-authored with his student, Lisa Crone, took a different tack, turning heavily towards myth as more of a, a structuring concept for meaning. And he you know, draws here from Nietzsche's notion of myth as a, a kind of measure of cultural unity or vitality, as well as uh, Roland Barthes' more critical view of consumer culture as a kind of contemporary myth-making. So Krippendorf is delving further into these fundamental questions of, of perception and moving away from the sort of analytical tools of, of semiotics. But McCoy and his students are entering this more metaphysical register. So showing, and this, this kind of split or the separation, I think shows that product semantics itself isn't just a, a static or, or kind of decided upon methodology, right? It's not just a toolkit, but it was actually an exploratory discourse that, that really remained open open and unresolved, even as it, it kind of gained greater success in, in different institutions and professional spaces. And so for, for Michael and his students, this new emphasis on myth marked a turn away from some of those earlier kind of uh, obvious formal references, what he would later call one-liners, towards more speculative work that dealt in kind of imagined technologies and new kinds of interactions. So Lisa Crone as a case study and her work, her student work demonstrates the before and after of this shift particularly well. Um, so I'm showing you here her phone book phone concept, which was realized in a couple of different, uh, slightly different versions. And I've been able to you know, examine the one at Cranbrook and there's, there's one at the Cooper Hewitt as well. This done in, in collaboration with the designer Tucker V. Meister of the New York City Studio Smart Design. Um, and this, this epitomizes this more referential approach, right? This kind of direct reference to a, an operative metaphor. So it's, it's very much aligned with its function, this idea of a phone that, that works like a phone book. And it's meant to communicate itself to a user without a thick instruction manual. And this, this was a really well-received design. It won um, a prestigious Forma Finlandia design competition, which was uh, sponsored by a Finnish oil company and was much published as a, a kind of calling card for, for this whole idea of, of product semantics. But then just one year later, Crone was working in a very different mode, presenting and these, these kinds of wearable technologies made with soft, slippery materials. They're far more suggestive and, and really unsettled, I think, in their relationship to existing technology at the time. Or, or even to the conventions of, of everyday life. They're kind of reaching beyond um, some of that earlier material. And another expression of this shift, at least as I see it, can be seen in a 1988 to 89 project su supported by the New York-based telecom company, Ninex. So seeking fresh ideas in, in what was a newly competitive market after the dissolution of the Bell Systems monopoly, Ninex established a new research division and offered some, some pretty significant funding towards Cranbrook student projects. 
uh, that dealt specifically with the future of information systems and the networked workplace. So it's kind of this, you know, this phone company after Bell dissolves, phone companies are suddenly having to compete and trying to find kind of new directions and new new energy. And so these these nine X projects sponsored within the the Cranbrook Studio were some of the most technically complex and and honestly aesthetically radical of of this period. And the the kind of heart of the these projects or the concerns that you see cropping up are computerized vision digital communication, you know, telepresence. And in fact, they they really seem to anticipate some of the kind of omnipresent networks that we live within today, right? But what I think is really key to, to kind of zone in on here, zoom in on here is the, the way that they are very individualistic and almost optimistic. They have this kind of uh, optimistic valence that really seems to me a little poignant in retrospect now that we're looking back from this moment of of kind of heightened concerns around surveillance and disinformation and the the kind of corporate consolidations of digital platforms none of that had happened yet right this is this is really kind of offering this this sort of beautiful hopeful future of of information technology and in the unconventional materials and and sort of strangely beautiful forms of of these projects these workstations proposed a kind of tactile lyrical vision for the information economy so just again, in this relationship between sort of theory and practice, these projects were really about offering new meanings and new purposes rather than uh, a kind of one-to-one -one relationship with the spheres of corporate engineering and, and the consumer market. Um, and the, the prompt for, for a lot of these projects was essentially to imagine a, a hyper-specific workstation for a specific type of, of user. So thinking again, even beyond you know the systems furniture that I, I think a lot of us might be familiar with in terms of corporate design and and really finding you know how can design address an individual um, even in a place that is you know has these connotations of kind of corporate sameness or uh, the you know the the kind of contemporary workplace and so in in offering these kind of fresh angles on relationships between people and material surroundings this whole idea of product semantics. And, and really in a larger sense, the McCoy's pedagogy at Cranbrook over 24 years really sought to position designers as interpreters of technological change, right? So the inherent ambiguity of, of this kind of charge or this mission sometimes led the, the studio, studio and the student works in directions that seemed to some bystanders as perhaps outlandish or impractical. And I, I find found this wonderful you know note from Hugh Aldersley Williams in 1990 that that dubs them the mannerists of microelectronics, um, which I think is for Hugh maybe sort of critical and admiring kind of an equal measure. Um, but then as, as this notion of ubiquitous computing started to threaten a kind of dematerialization of design, you know, it writ large and with it, the potential obsolescence of industrial designers, traditional forms of, of knowledge and expertise. I think this Cranbrook vision of a specifically tangible digital future uh, really sort of staked a claim for designers' relevance, and not just as rational systems-bound technocrats, but as subjective mediators. You know, people are sort of sensitive to these shifting tides of technology and how the end users would perhaps feel, um, in, you know, in these interactions. And as the McCoys wrote further in that same 1988 catalog, it's not the digital, but the intuitive, not the measurable, but the poetic, and not the mechanical, but the sensual, which provide the essential humanization of design. So while many of these influential speculations coming out of the, the Cranbrook design program, for the most part, remained speculative, you know, eventually running up against kind of pragmatic limits of, of corporate design and manufacturing and so on, they, they represented a really sincere attempt to bring technological and symbolic abstractions back into the concrete, back into the world of tangible things and the bodies that use them. And in doing so made a really lasting contribution to some of the broader debates about responsibilities and limits of design here on the cusp of the digital age. So thank you so much. And I will stop my screen. Deborah, I think, I think we're on. Hey, thank you, Colin. Um, that was a fascinating, uh, look at what was uh, definitely a pivotal time in the Academy's history as well as design history. And I know that you were, 
our first uh, visiting researcher after I began at uh, Cranberg Archives. You and I together worked through some new ways that uh, the archives could assist uh, researchers. So it's really gratifying uh, to see uh, the product of all of that hard work that you did when you were with us for three weeks. Um, so let's take a, a step back here and look now uh, more closely at a few of the items, some of the ones that you have mentioned already in uh, your talk, and then a few others that you found uh, while you were here with us in uh, 2019. And just really quickly, though, before we do that, I think it's uh, interesting to point out that your research on the McCoys didn't actually be begin with your visit to us at the Cranbrook Archives, um, which would make um, you know the most sense perhaps to others since their official uh, papers from their tenure are with us here. So if you can just spend a few moments talking um, and describing your research path and the, the role that the archives played in supporting that. Yeah, absolutely. So as as Deborah, you know, alludes, um, the the whole process actually started with with Kathy and Mike. You know, I I made a visit to them uh, in in Colorado. This is pre Santa Fe, um, both to you know just just meet and sort of chat through my ideas, my my interest in you know their history at Cranbrook, um, and really honestly just to get you know permission to you know are you willing to sort of undergo this this. <laughs> process because it it you know as much as you know uh, as much as I'm a historian you know studying to studying the history of design and and creating interpretations I'm also a, a curator who works with living artists all the time and I think that that kind of relationship building is is crucial and so this I idea of sort of respecting you know respecting the artist and and bringing them into the process in some ways is was really important to me so on that level that was that was kind of the very first step and then I had the the great luxury to visit Mike and Kathy uh, for just under a week um, again at their home, both to sit down with some formal oral history interviews and then to look at their private archive. You know, as much as they donated to Cranbrook, they still hold a, a huge amount of visual material. So that was uh, as well as some documents and and so on. So. That was kind of the the first place that I really started to dig into sources, you know, documents and and visual material itself. Um, and from there, you know, that that led me to realize of, you know, of course, this is just one piece of the puzzle. And the the papers at Cranbrook tell a whole a whole other history. Um, so that it, it was still fairly early in in the process, I would say, but I I did want to start with Mike and Kathy and um, another component of this has been a, you know, an ongoing program of of interviews with former students of of Mike and Kathy. So uh, some of whom are on this call, you know, folks I've I've been able to sit down with. Um, I still have a long list of folks I'd really like to talk to, and am am kind of working through that as as time allows. So um, it is this this interesting subject where oral history and archival research and the the kind of typical tools of formal analysis, you know, looking at objects and and studying them in in that way, um, those three things all come together in a really crucial way. Great, yeah, thanks. I I totally agree with the uh, um, you know the personal side, the first person narrative um, component of research. I think that's one of the reasons why. You know, archives have moved more to, um, you know, focusing on oral histories. So mm -hmm. you and I need to talk after this um, program about that. Happy to, uh, yeah. <laughs> but let's, um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here a minute. And so you can walk us through one example of how their, their papers here added context to materials you found elsewhere. Yeah, so this, as I sort of alluded, you know, in in the course of the talk, um, the the papers are are honestly meticulously organized. So credit to everyone involved in that, from Mike and Kathy to the the staff of the center. Um, the I think one of the key things was being able to kind of piece together uh, these these 
timelines from, you know, I, I had the sort of broad strokes of of their work at, at Cranbrook um, from the interviews that I'd done with, with Mike and Kathy. And so being able to take that that sort of larger picture and hone in on on particular moments and reconstruct them from documents was was really valuable. Um, and in this case, actually using uh, documents that I'd found in the McCoy's own archives and kind of corroborating them or or finding explanatory material in the archives. So uh, on the left, you're seeing um, one of these Phillips internal design newsletters, and and on the right is is a lovely letter from Bob Blake mentioning this project that he's trying to get going you know starting this newsletter let me know what you think um so being able to to get uh insight into that relationship and tr kind of trace it over time was was really useful and and Blake is kind of the the poster child maybe for this moment and this talk because you know I'm looking at the sort of 3D side of the studio and their interactions with Phillips but it's the same for for many of the other um, folks that that Mike and Kathy have have collaborated with, and I think we have a few other examples too um, in in the futures or in the forthcoming slides, right? About um, kind of being able to trace this. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and in fact, this is the this is the letter, right? Where where Bob tells them, "I've left Herman Miller." Um, at this point, he hadn't yet been hired at, at Phillips, but you can sort of, with with the advantage of rear view vision, you know, we can say, oh, this was this was when this sort of foreshadows a uh, 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 later things to come from the Phillips side. And the uh, beautiful handwritten note. This is the other thing. Getting actual manuscript materials is is so fun. Um, and this is a note, you know, not not long after. Uh, like arrives at Phillips and is just saying, you know, everything's going well and and getting a sense too of of how these relationships were not just um kind of one-sided utilitarian professional relationships, but there actually was a very deep kind of connection over a course of many years. And and you'll maybe see here at the uh at the bottom that um there's this note about AGI, the Alliance Graphique Internationale, one of these professional organizations. Um, so that these things are kind of all circulating through or, or being filtered through these relationships. And yeah, sorry, please feel free to advance. Um, and this is, uh, I think, after a Mike writes um, Bob to propose a, a kind of deeper collaboration between Phillips and Cranbrook, and then going forward yet again, uh, you know, there's uh, a sort of, this is, I think, after their first visit, yeah, in, in 81. Um, I, I I don't know. I just I th I think these kinds of things are so valuable for fleshing out a kind of richer uh, view of of not just the relationships, but also how Mike and Kathy were so savvy at at kind of using their time and energy to build relationships outside Cranbrook. You know, which which is a a small program. You know, each cohort is only about a, in the design pro program was only about a dozen people a year, but being able to kind of bring a bigger universe of design into this program while also themselves acting as you know professionals in in the field and and as many people you know watching will know cranbrook faculty are in residence right they're artists in residence designers in residence they're expected to have a kind of ongoing professional practice so uniting those worlds of pedagogy and and practice is is at the heart of it and just you know these these documents showing okay so bob blake arrives to Phillips, he says, hey, Mike and Kathy, come see what I'm doing here, come help us out. And that translates not only into, you know, future professional work and commissions and, and the workshops and so on. But then I think the following slide. Uh, oh, sorry, this, this is another really great uh, uh, example of kind of how the documents create a, a real sense of like, what this lived experience was. And so this is, you know, historians are always trying to get at this sense of what was it actually like? And working only from documentary sources, they have kind of inbuilt biases and omissions, and in many cases are just simply very dry. But I found, you know, a, a lot of these materials, you can kind of read them against the grain or, or read between the lines to get a sense of what this was like, you know, this really active period of travel for Mike and Kathy and 
And, you know, of course, I also have the benefit of being able to ask them and, and have done so. But again, just, you know, thinking through the, the real pace of, of a lot of this work, you know, not just managing the studios at Cranbrook, but, but having a kind of professional practice, a consultancy, um, raising a family as well, you know, so these are these are these kind of human issues, these these very kind of real experiences that that bubble up in unexpected ways. So even just this this inventory of projects that that Kathy did for Phillips over the span of, you know, a couple of weeks of of residence there. Um and thinking through, you know, mileage and gasoline, that there there was this this very kind of uh logistical thinking of of how to make this all happen. Um yeah, and, and I, I think that's such a, it's just so special to be able to, to kind of reconstruct that through documents as well as through through interviews. I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I cut you off. No, no, that's fine. I was just going to say that, you know, immediately my eye went to 29 hours of childcare. Um, and, you know, it's not something you often see. So I agree. It is, it is great to see um, documents like this that really give you that sense of how they managed to, you know, fit all of that work uh, into their real lives. Yeah, and there's, I remember seeing another list that was, you know, returning from their, their sort of sabbatical in, in the Netherlands and the packing list of, you know, all of these books and posters that have been acquired because, of course, you know, designers and academics, what do we want? We want books and we want posters. Um, so, I, you know, folding all of that, that kind of personal interest and the way it unites with with professional interests in in Mike and Kathy's case is, you know, as as anyone who knows them knows, they're like incredibly curious and interested in the world, and and are always able to, to kind of draw connections between people and and you know the materials that they're interested in. But it's it's important to have the kind of documentary corroboration of that too. You know, um, thinking about this kind of larger scope of of a dissertation and and how to turn that into kind of evidence. Right. I think this this might be the next one that you had alluded to. Um, you know, that kind of shows their uh how they interwove both professional and um academic pursuits and created these networks. So if you can talk a little bit about that as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think one of the the things that the the papers at Cranbrook made me realize, you know, not just for my own uh, uh, my own project and and the work on Cranbrook and Mike and Kathy's time there, but really in in a bigger sense for design history, professional organizations are so important and really under I think understudied, under documented. Um, so these these spaces of networking, you know, they're people meet each other on committees, there's always an education committee, there's always a, a, you know, an ex exhibition or publications committee for things like AIGA, you know, the, the Institute of Graphic Artists or IDSA, Industrial Designer Society of America. And each of these organizations has its own kind of institutional history as well. It, they go through name changes, they go through kind of internal conflicts. And, and so seeing how deeply you know, Mike and Kathy were embedded in some of these organizations and how they, you know, served on these juries, as you can see here in this, this uh, uh, example, um, and reading, you know, jury deliberations for for design competitions and things like that, it, it has really made me realize that these are, I think, a, a deeply kind of underappreciated um, agent in the history of design. You know, we we often talk about institutions that have a kind of easily graspable sort of architectural life you know they are places they have histories they have archives and individuals you know we we certainly always gravitate toward the human as a kind of historical subject but i'm i'm so interested in in these these kind of uh intra or intermural uh organizations like like um icograda um the Society for Environmental Graphic Designers and so on. So I think, you know, a, a lot of what what bubbles up in the papers themselves was, you know, these were these were cr critical networks for um, you know, building relationships as as educators, but then also developing opportunities for students at Cranbrook, right? So um, being able to point students towards competitions to enter, um, 
being able to to kind of connect students with organizations for small scale freelance work is is something that happened a lot in in Cranbrook. You know, Kathy was able to say, "Hey, these people need a they need a newsletter ish designed or a journal designed," and so that. Uh, in 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 both the micro sense of of this project and the macro sense of design history, you know, I think there's so much more work to be done. And there's there's actually a really great book on my shelf over here, um, specifically about international design organizations. So this is starting to, I think, rise to the fore as as something that needs a lot more study. Great. You also told me that you came to understand. Uh, how the McCoys leverage their professional connections to create opportunities for academy students. Um, here's an example of um, an alumni. Um, walk us through some of these examples, beginning with this one. Yeah. So in in some ways, um, th this is a great you know example, less for the student work, um, but more for how the McCoys kind of really tried and this is something you know i'm i'm using mike and kathy's words here so uh, in my interviews with them but they they really started out in their time at cranbrook by trying to reach out to alumni you know there there didn't seem to be at that point in 71 to be much of a kind of relationship between the academy and some of its its notable um design alums so here in the case of niels different who worked at henry dreyfus um and had this kind of incredible career especially in systems furniture ergonomic seating um, so being able to kind of reconnect the institution to those external, uh, or, or those, you know, people from its own past was, was the beginning of, of kind of creating a new energy within the design department. And, and I know Andrew Blavelt's also here who has recently, you know, curated and, and edited an incredible show and book on the, the larger history of the institution. So I think, you know, that there is this, this kind of ongoing work, right, to recover a lot of these connections um and then you know thinking about i think the next slide will be one of these really direct examples of how mike and kathy always sought to to connect students to opportunities so here's a letter um from mike to bob at bob blake at phillips basically proposing a kind of residency for students or a, a sort of internship exchange and and this is something you know that that kathy and mike were able to set up with a couple of graphic design studios in in the netherlands as well and you know, Dutch design at this moment in the '80s was very, very kind of cool. There was a lot of really interesting stuff happening in the graphics, uh, graphics sector. Um, so that you know, just being able to see from these papers and these documents that that their work and their connections were not were not just about building a kind of self-aggrandizing reputation, right? It's not about creating this institution of the McCoys, but it's about using these connections to provide opportunities for students and to get them out into the world and get them working in other studios, you know, sort of outside the, the Cranbrook uh, environs. And yeah, here, um, what I, it was, it almost became a kind of leitmotif of, of my entire time in the archives was, oh, here's another person asking for posters from Cranbrook and Kathy immediately writing back and saying, of course, here's some posters. We have that, you know, that one's out of print, sorry, but here's a new one. So I think that kind of informal exchange is is so important to to kind of keep in mind that you know the, these sort of very official moments of design history, the exhibitions and the the produced designs and the the kind of flagship moments of of any institutional or or individual designer's life, um, you know th those are obviously important to study and to understand in detail. But these kind of this this sort of second layer of of informal relations and and uh communication and and the the ties that that bind these different institutions and people are are really wonderful to to try to to trace and reconstruct great um yeah so let's finish off here by just talking about how you know archives of course, like to present the most complete historical record uh, possible. Admittedly, it's a selective process. Um, so I think it's just as important to talk about, um, you know, what you found while you sifted, what you didn't find when you sifted through mm -hmm. all this information. So what might you have expected to find in the McCoy papers, but didn't? Mm. Yeah, that's, that's, I think, a really great question to to draw attention to the fact that archives themselves are constructed right they're they're not a kind of like 
natural or neutral you know fossil record but they they are themselves the result of decisions and and all, which is you know sort of archival theory 101 but is is something to always you know re remind ourselves of um you know th there there were some interesting sort of omissions or, or not omissions but absences i'd say um the the documents i think largely skewed towards the 2d side of the practice um of the the studio which initially was more kind of integrated and, and well always was integrated as as many of the students you know will, will be happy to tell you but especially in the early earlier moments um of of Mike and Kathy's time there in the sort of 70s into the into the late 70s um most of the documentation just happens to be from the the kind of 2d side of the studio so and, and another one you know I we we talked about this a little bit um before was the kind of visual material right so th these really are just documents for the most part um so I've I've had to look in other places to to get access to the the things right the the objects so you you very kindly put behind you I, I can point out some of these uh models from the Cranbrook Art Museum collection so that was just an you know kind of easy walk around the corner um while, while I was there but it's it's interesting you know sort of what ends up in which repository right what what kinds of things land in different places so I was also you know like I said I was so lucky to to have the chance to look at some of the the personal material that that Mike and Kathy have and um was was so thrilled to find just binders and binders of slides of student work so some of which has been published you know and is is very kind of visible and I I showed some of those examples right of how these things circulated in a kind of bigger um kind of visual economy if you will but uh but seeing you know other work that that didn't have that same kind of afterlife um I think was really really valuable so you know it there are there are these interesting kind of uh just it's the the physical nature of the material too right slides are so difficult to to kind of house and and preserve in in some sense versus the the more familiar papers so yeah, that's what really comes to mind, at least with the the question. I'm sure if I sat with it, I'd I'd think of other examples. But um, yeah, no, thank you for that. And and I will just echo your your uh, sentiment that we're grateful um, to our colleagues at the art museum that we have this close relationship. You're not the only you know researcher that comes to us that is researching in both collections and we're you know literally on the other side of a glass wall um so you know it's not a mistake that um they were able to uh provide these models um for your uh, presentation today so i always want to say you know that that, that I'm grateful that we have that, you know, kind of back and forth to the benefit, of course, um, like to researchers. Absolutely, like yeah. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much for giving us a glimpse into your uh, research process. I want, I think we have a, a few moments here to uh, take some questions and some comments. Um, of course, we're very pleased, uh, Kathy and Michael, that you could join us today. And I know there's a lot of um, people out there in our audience that were students or affiliated with the Academy uh, at this time, not putting anybody on the spot. But if you want to, you know, chime in, provide some context, some personal anecdotes, ask questions, um, now is your time. I don't see any um chats in the chat box so maybe that means everybody wants to do this in person <laughs> or so got so zonked out with the semiotic theory that uh <laughs> <laughs> I, I think mike and kathy have a oh, there we go you're unmuted now yes please hi can you hear me yep yeah. Uh, I thought this was going to be a roast, so I'm kind of uh, relieved. <laughs> <laughs> well, and maybe, um, you know, your discussion about the archives and, you know, the uh, museum collection and, you know, those resources, maybe it would be useful to know that what are in the archives are things that came out of our file cabinets at Cranbrook in their studio 
very quickly. Mm. You know, this is at the end of our 24 years, we're moving, you know, household as well as studio. Uh, it's very, you know, kind of very busy time. And um, I kept quite careful files at first. And then as the years went by, I just had this stack of papers from the Daily Mail and anything that had any value, I just added to that stack of papers day by day and um, eventually then put them in the file cabinet without like a lot of organization. I'm the saver <laughs> of the two of us. So Mike probably received a number of communications that he didn't save. I, I really don't don't know what you maybe you had a stack also we put in the file boxes but when we left the um cranbrook archivist at the time mark Corrier, you know, amazingly said i'm like what are we going to do with this stuff and he said i want it all <laughs> i'm like you do and um and he brought me file boxes and he left them out in front of our studio and i just like in a rush, you know, put mm -hmm. everything, what, you know, and filled up probably like 20 file boxes and left them out in front of our studio in the studio lobby mm -hmm. and they went away. <laughs> he took them. So my stuff is all highly confidential and yeah. locked away in a vault somewhere in <laughs> Maybe. An undisclosed location. <laughs> <laughs> Well, actually, I, I think that that raises an interesting point, Mike, because you you did a lot of work for in, in addition to the studio practice, right? The the teaching you did work for some major corporations like Knoll and so on, and yeah. I think they you're you're very right to to point out that they like to keep a tighter grip on their intellectual property. So yeah. that's something. And and now that Knoll and Herman Miller have merged into Miller Knoll, and I think the corporate archive is sort of in this interesting moment of flux. So. That's something that I'm, you know, still hoping to to finally dig into and like get some really juicy material on the bulldog chair. But uh, <laughs> uh, in the meantime, you know, making do with ephemera, right? You have some great brochures and and things like that. So there there are these always another way kind of into it. But um, yeah, I, I, Kathy, that's such a great story, and and thank goodness for for the archivist at that time who had the the side yeah. sort of dedication and and willingness to devote storage space to to that. And so, yeah, they they went away, those file boxes, amazingly, and went to the archives. And then the process that they went through after that, I I have no idea what, but it must have taken a lot of work. And I have never been to the archives to see how they were organized, you know, by type or are they consecutive? Because my stacks, after the first year or so, where things were in file folders after that they were it was just pretty much a consecutive stack of anything that was meaningful that came in the mail and copies of things that I sent letters that I, I sent I think now uh Andrew is working on the Miller Knoll mm, that's right so and uh Knoll has um a pretty good archive um I know Herman Miller has a really good one yeah there there's um, really impressive and Noel, uh, I think we just provided to Andrew some connections to the people at Noel that um, mm -hmm. have archived the uh, the work there. So, well, and also look forward to that show, Andrew. What's it coming out, man? <laughs> uh, summer twenty five. <laughs> no, oh, really? no oh, pressure, okay. man. There's a date. Oh, good. Yeah. Uh, also, um, I think Kirk Brown is uh, on this um, Zoom. And uh, Design on Screen, um, you know, a, a film uh, foundation is producing films on design, and I believe mm. they are working on one on Florence Noel right now. Yeah, oh, wonderful. And so we've been talking to um, Kirk also about how we might assist and what we might have of use. And of course, the archives and the museum collection are, are really important sources. And also, it's just an interesting you know, kind of coincidence of interest. It's also interesting in that uh, early on at Cranbrook, we did a show in the art museum right. called right. Noel and Herman Miller, and we split the museum right down the middle, Yeah, that main gallery. They were in there, the Noel and Herman Miller, Miller, Herman Miller people were in there measuring to make sure that 
center line was exactly <laughs> in the middle. Uh, and it talked about both their historic product and their design process. So uh, it's, it's great to see that there'll be another show it's that, really great. that yeah. celebrates those two companies right. that have yeah. a lot of roots in Cranberg. And Colin, you know, it's, it's interesting that you found all these communications with Bob Blake. Um, and that's where that Nolan Herman Miller show was when, when we met Bob Blake. Right, uh, yeah. We worked together to choose the uh, materials for the exhibition. And then it's also where we got to know the our Noel, very good friend from then on, um, Jeffrey Osborne. Osborne, yeah. So that, that show yeah. was really important for us. Um, it should also be noted in terms of archives, you know, Bob Blake had an executive secretary and, and a staff below that. So uh, his communications are really very well documented, right? I mean, he everything was in writing and yeah, uh, other other a lot of other forms of people that we had a lot of interaction with and communications. <laughs> it was more informal, and you don't wind up with that documentation mm -hmm. in the archives because of that. But even so, what what does exist, I think, is is like I was saying, kind of crucial to just reconstruct the timeline and and sort of the the cause and effect chain, right? And oh, and being yeah. able to say like this this happened really at this exact moment and yeah. It's amazing what you found. And because this whole thing, you know, sending all our, our materials over to the archives happened in such a rush, you know, like a few days before we left Cranbrook. I'm like, I never went through it. <laughs> it's like, what's in there? <laughs> yeah, it's, it, well, as as you can see, it's it's a lot of correspondence. Yeah. Um, it's, I mean, it's so rich though. It, it really is, I, I think it's, rare to have such a, a deeply kind of documented um, set of, of relationships really is, is what it comes down to. It should be noted that Colin has offered to sell us back a few embarrassing <laughs> documents <laughs> at a certain price. Yeah. <laughs> Let's hope it doesn't come to that. Uh, not at all. I was I was too busy geeking out over, you know, a signed letter from George Nelson or something like that, being like, he touched this, you know, to to collect anything too incriminating. Well, I would I'd be remiss, Kathy and Michael, if I didn't add that, you know, we view these collections as living collections. And so there is no reason that um, their point in time needs to end uh, the day you left Cranbrook. So, you want uh, more stuff? I could send more stuff. <laughs> send are... more stuff. We always help you move from Colorado to <laughs> That's right. <laughs> now we have to empty out that storeroom, uh, you know, so yes, we should talk. You do have a large loading dock where you can, a semi truck can back up. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Anybody yes, else? I know we only have like a minute or two left. I want to be, you know, respectful of everybody's uh, evening here. I wish we could keep going, but. Um, I should say that Kathy was, I, I did retrieve some materials uh -huh. from, their, from their stash in Colorado. And so we're still sorting through that. Uh, it's largely art, visual artifacts, um, posters and things like that. But there are some article reprints and other kinds of things that probably belong in the archive. So one I day know. you come across the glass wall. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, a few there's... of those pieces have already made it. We have a good chain, you know, going here. <laughs> well, I, I should say, Andrew, too, that it's it's so great that, you know, right as I was starting this process, too, you had also taken some of the materials that Kathy had saved of, like, student sort of process work. And I think it's so smart as, as an art museum to be collecting these kinds of unformed or, or kind of proto-objects, you know, things that aren't necessarily a full realized finished designed thing because that's that's material that so often just gets thrown out so i you know the the art museum is is totally part of of the this this process too yeah that's probably something we need to discuss with the archives <laughs> they're not <laughs> stats and they're not very archival but <laughs> there's, there's there's also something called the dumpster archives <laughs> 
Oh yeah, that's for getting burned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this uh, this is recorded. Is there a way to get a recording uh, um, later of the of this so uh, um, event? That's true. Yeah. I believe so. Um, yes, we are we are recording it, and um, with Colin's uh, permission. Uh -huh. uh, we will uh, typically what we do is for the people that registered, we make it available, uh, especially the people who weren't able to join us and um, we'll have conversations about how more broadly we disseminate it. Great, thank you. And Kirk, um, Kirk is a, lives in Denver. Colin grew up in Pueblo and visits his family manse frequently. Quite often, so yeah. We should probably meet. <laughs> I'd, I'd love that. Thank you very much. We would welcome that anytime. Likewise, uh, we'll, we'll be in touch. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Okay, well, um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, uh, Kathy and Michael, Andrew, and everybody else who joined us uh, this evening. It was um, delightful. Um, have a great night. <laughs>